Hold on one second here. Function. Everything good with you? Yeah, all good, thanks. All good, thanks, Dan. Cool. This is Umar Ahmed for IFL TV in association with MTK Global. Via Zoom, I'm joined by Dan Raphael. Uh, we're living in a crazy world, Dan. We'll uh, discuss that, but we'll start on a, a more personal note, Dan. Of course, a, a big change for you recently in a, in a work capacity. How have the last couple of uh, months been since you left ESPN? In, like a lot of people, I've, I've been home uh, doing less, I guess, but it's been, it's been interesting because I'm so used to traveling but there's been no fights to travel to. And I, so I've been home with my wife and my son. Uh, and so it's, it's been different because normally I'm, I work from home by myself or I'm on the road when I travel. Uh, so it's been a lot of family time, which is not the worst thing in the world. It's been good. I mean, but uh, I've been keeping busy with stuff. You know, uh, I, I've been hosting a show on the Impact Network, a boxing interview show that's been a lot of fun. We did, uh, we did six episodes, which is our, comprised our first season. The final episode of that season airs on Friday night, where my interview guest is Keith Thurman. Uh, but we've had some great guests. We, uh, we had Leonard Ellerby, Ryan Garcia, Sean Porter, uh, Jose Ramirez, Keith, and I don't want to forget anybody. Um, but th those are the types of guests we've had. Um, we're gonna, they're going to rerun those six episodes on the network over the next uh, several weeks. And then uh, we're in the process of getting a second season. They, they, they're bringing me back for a second season for a much longer uh, run of show. So sometime in North, closer to you know the end of July or so or mid July I guess we'll be back doing new episodes so I'm excited about that it's been a terrific opportunity the folks at Impact are great to work with they're committed to boxing because not only are they doing the show that I'm hosting but they're going to start doing some live boxing events uh, in the in the not too distant future not necessarily at the highest level not pay-per-view big names and stuff but I think I would uh, for the American fans will know what I'm talking about more on the level of say Friday Night Fights that used to be the ESPN uh, two shows that were uh, prior to uh, the beginning of their uh, association with PBC and then Top Rank. So I've been doing that, and I've been writing for Boxing Scene. And my, uh, my good buddy Rick Reno, who runs the website, has been great. Uh, so I'm writing some stories from them several times a week. And, and uh, another friend of mine, Dougie Fisher, who's the editor-in-chief of The Ring magazine, has asked me to do some pieces uh, for the, mat, the print magazine. Uh, my first one is in uh, their special Arturo Gatti issue, which is just out. So I actually haven't even seen it yet. I'm excited to get that because... Those who know me know Gaddy is my all-time favorite fighter. So when Dougie asked me to write a piece uh, for the magazine, I was pretty excited about it. And, uh, you know, maybe a couple of pieces for their website as well. So, you know, I'm still doing my work. I'm still staying involved. Uh, but I've had some time to relax. You know, listen, Omar, it's been uh, included, not in my boxing days, plus my journalism sports days, non-boxing. I've been on deadlines for 27 years. So although it wasn't my preference to leave ESPN, it hasn't been the worst thing in the world just from the standpoint of like, you know, recharge your batteries a little bit, even if it's under unusual circumstances of being at home uh, constantly. Yeah, I'm hearing you on that one. I know the uh, Impact Network, uh, Mario does a lot of work on that, doesn't he? I know Mario well. Yeah, Mario Serrano was hired to do the public relations for the show. He's doing a great job and getting the word out and uh, I appreciate everything he's been doing. Dan, uh, we're not getting too much news in, in boxing right now, but the one bit of news uh, has been a massive uh, story in, in terms of Joshua and Fury have agreed financial terms uh, for a two-fight deal in 2021. Now, a lot of us are getting excited at this news, but there is still no venue, no signed contracts, uh, no location, no dates. Um, but it seems like the biggest hurdle in, in these mega fights, which is finances and splits, uh, and the terms for that have been agreed, which seems like it's a, a big first step in getting this uh, undisputed fight done. Oh, there's no doubt about that. I mean, like you mentioned, all the things that have to still take place. So, you know, I'm not wishing against the fight by any means. Like every boxing fan, I'm super excited and hope that it happens. But I've also been around long enough to know that nobody should get their hopes up until a deal is a deal that's done. You know, I always remember when Richard Schaefer was working for Golden Boy, and I would talk to him about many of the big fights he was involved with. A lot of them were Mayweather fights, Oscar De La Hoya fights, and so many others. You know, he would constantly, and it got to be a joke with us. He goes, a, a signed deal is a done deal. And he's right about that. So while I have no reason to believe that the Fury camp or the Joshua camp is in any way doing these things in bad faith, I think they're doing them in good faith. I believe that both athletes very much want the fight. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a skeptic when it comes to these things. I've been burned as a fan, had my heartstrings pulled too many times uh, to, to 
to take it that seriously. Yes, I do take it seriously. And I, I believe that they have come to some term of agreement in terms of how they're going to divvy up the money. But there is a, so many other things that have to take place before they actually step into the ring with each other. Not the least of which, by the way, is that each of them are going to have at least one interim fight. I, I, is it possible maybe even a second one? I don't know. But uh, like you said, there's all the issues about where it's going to take place given, uh, you know, if there was no pandemic, you know, you know you'd say you're going to have the fight at Wembley Stadium or something like that because they put 100,000 people in there with no problem. Uh, in this day and age, though, that's not necessarily the best course of action. So, you know, there's many things that need to be worked out between now and when they step into the ring. I hope it happens. Um, but I have to say one thing that, that, that to me was an obvious thing. To me, it always was if they're going to fight, it was always going to be a 50-50 split. And it was always going to be a two-fight deal. I mean, maybe somebody can name a different one. But what's in my tenure of covering boxing, big heavyweight fights, big fights, period, usually, they, unless it's a, you know, a mandatory, they don't come without multiple fights in the involved in the deal. It's happened many times. I mean, you can go back and, you know, I talked to somebody else about this not that long ago. Look at some of the biggest heavyweight fights we've seen in, you know, the last, say, 20, 25 years. You know, Lewis Tyson was a two-fight deal. Yes, they fought only once, but it was a two-fight deal. They just opted out of the second fight, as was, you know, Tyson's right as the loser. Uh, Klitschko Joshua, same thing. Klitschko had the option to come back and have a second fight. He decided not to take it, and he retired. I mean, that's, that's just the way these things go. So the things that were said on the record this week about it, a 50-50 split and a two-fight deal, you know, to me, that was sort of like giving water to a, to a fish. Like, okay, obviously that's going to be the case. Dan, you've been around fighters all your life. What do you think Kubrat Pulev and Deontay Wilder are thinking right now, considering we're all talking about Fury Joshua, and Joshua has to beat Pulev and Fury has to beat the bronze bomber? No question about it. I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, and this is certainly not the first time that there's been some prospect of a mega fight in the future where there was other business to be taken care of. And you can look just not that long ago before we got to see the, the rematch between uh, Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury. They both had two interim fights and we all, you know, they had to win those fights. And then it got down to the last hurdle. You know, first of all, back up for the, the second to last fight of, the, of that situation. You had, you had Tyson Fury against Otto Whaling and he almost lost. You know, he got caught severely. I mean, in some places, maybe the fight would have been stopped and their fight would have gone down the drain. You know, fortunately for Tyson Fury, you know, he was able to stay in the fight. And the cut man did a great job and he was able to win, you know, clearly on points. And then Deontay Wilder had what I think most people consider to be a dangerous fight in a rematch against Luis King Kong Ortiz. He got his butt outboxed for most of that fight and then he was able to come back and land that one mega punch and knock the guy out. But, you know, that was done knowing that the next step was going to be a rematch against Fury. So now you have a similar situation where they got to deal with Wilder and, 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 uh, and AJ has to deal with Pulev. So I think those fighters, look, they're pros. I think they probably use it as some sort of motivation, nothing to cry about. I mean, we can sit here and talk about Joshua and Fury and everybody else in the world, all other media and fans can talk about it. But the, the two people that can really make sure that it doesn't happen, who have that power in their fists, that's Kubra Pulev and Deontay Wilder. And so, you know, they should not be uh, in any way offended by it. But if they are, they could use it as motivation. You know, I'm pretty sure that neither one of them really cares. They're like, look, they can plan all they want. But we've got next against these two dudes. And, you know, we, if we take care of our business, you know, they probably believe they can put themselves in that position to fight uh, for the undisputed title. Having said that, of course, Fury is the favorite against Wilder and Joshua is the favorite against Pulev. So let's say those are the outcomes. We know in the UK, Dan, you've been here before, you know how uh, popular boxing is amongst the fans. And obviously Tyson Fury and Anthony Joshua are household names here. You know, you'll be, be hard to find someone who doesn't know either of them in the UK. Out of interest, though, um, obviously no Americans involved in this potential undisputed fight. How big is a fight? between Fury and Joshua in the, in the States, Dan? Certainly among boxing fans, it's huge. I mean, it's still, if you ask any boxing fan, regardless of the, the participants' uh, nationalities, I don't think there's anybody that would say otherwise that it's not the biggest boxing match that can be made in the sport today. Um, whether it resonates to the mainstream sports fan who aren't necessarily boxing followers, I don't know about that because, you know, Fury certainly has a name. He's got a, I'll say this, my, my opinion, my viewpoint, uh, anecdotal, of course, is that 
Fury has a much bigger name in America than Joshua. And that's largely because of the massive amount of promotion and, and push that he got over his three previous fights, the two of, you know, the quote unquote tuna fights against uh, Tom Schwartz and, and Welling. And then of course the third fight, or rather the second fight against Wilder, which was a big pay-per-view fight that was just promoted to death over here. Uh, Joshua is not nearly the name that he has. He's only had the one fight in America and, you know, it got a fair amount of publicity and obviously had the big upset situation, uh, but it was broadcast on the zone, which, you know, has done a good job with their boxing, but is not in every household the way an ESPN is, doesn't have that mainstream uh, name to the, to the general public. So, you know, it's a big fight, but I think that here, particularly because if the fight happens between Wilder, I mean, uh, between Fury and Joshua, it probably won't take place in America. It'll take place either in hopefully in the UK or some other exotic location where they're putting up a lot of money. So the United States would not be the location. Therefore, it would probably not air uh, on TV or a streaming service in a time zone conducive to American viewing at its height. So, you know, honestly, it's huge for, for boxing fans. I don't really think it's that big of a deal to the, the general sporting public in America. Honestly, I don't think really, I mean, I'm not saying they don't care about it. A lot of them don't know about it. You know, maybe they'll be, they'll, it'll get a publicity because it is going to be the, the undisputed title. So mainstream outlets that don't even cover boxing all that much, like the New York Times, for example, probably would cover that fight in some capacity. So it would, it would get some attention. And, you know, but it, it's huge pretty much everywhere except America, to be honest, it seems to me. I can't wait for it, but, you know, I'm a hardcore boxing guy. So, uh, but it's just not that big over here in my mind. Yeah, I think most people from uh, America within within the boxing media world would say that it probably wouldn't resonate with the the general sport fan. But what about Fury Wilder? Did that, you know, the second fight, did that resonate with the general sport fan in America or not? I think it probably did from the standpoint that if you were a sports fan in the United States, you could not avoid the the, the fight because there was so much media and so much attention to it. You know, in the United States, the number one sports outlet is ESPN and all the various platforms, whether it's the website or their a radio uh, network or the, the the channels on your TV or on your app or whatever, you can't really avoid it. Uh, so that it was everywhere. And then probably the second biggest sports outlet in the United States is Fox Sports, which is their is the Deontay Wilder uh, broadcast partner. And so you had the two behemoths, one on basic cable. Uh, you had mainstream network Fox, which is terrestrial, which was promoting the show, the, the fight on their live on their live broadcast of the Super Bowl and other major sporting events, including their boxing events. You know, you could not avoid that fight. So it got huge amount of hype. I remember sitting in the media center at the MGM and realizing how big the fight was from the American uh, sports media standpoint, where in, in the press room, they have these long tables set up for the media guys to sit there and do their work. And on alternate ends of the, of, the, of the stage where they would do press conferences and stuff, they have gigantic TV. So on the right-hand side, they had the TV tuned to ESPN, and there was stuff about the fight. I looked up, and it was one of the interviews or whatever. And then I looked over to my left, and the other TV on the other side of the dais was tuned to Fox Sports Net. And they were doing a separate thing on the fight. And so that was at the same time, and it was like that pretty much every day for like a week, not to mention their their, their uh, promotion of the fight even prior to the week of the fight. So it got a huge amount of exposure here. So you'd think it was going to do a monster pay-per-view number, but it didn't. And I don't think that was for lack of interest in the fight because everywhere you went, people were interested in talking about it. It was all over the place. But the, the, the general thought is the piracy involved in pay-per-view is so rampant. It's so easy to, to, to steal a fight signal without paying the you know, 80 or $90 for the pay-per-view that the, the pay-per-view numbers – didn't do very well relative to what it cost to do the fights. I think the pay-per-views were like around, I thought I heard 800,000-ish, which would be terrific, you know, for guys that really hadn't been much on pay-per-view except for their, their very first fight uh, with each other, which only did about 350. So it was a big increase from the first fight. The problem was the amount of money that was guaranteed to the boxers made it where that event probably lost money, amazingly, even that 800,000 home uh, pay-per-view buys, not to mention another roughly $17 million and change in terms of ticket sales. So, you know, people knew about it, but the pay-per-view numbers, I don't think reflected it. Dan, I mentioned many times in this interview so far, the word undisputed, right? I spoke to Mauricio Suleiman yesterday. Um, I know where we're going with this. <laughs> 
And, you know, I, I tried to get it out of him. But he said that Fury Wilder obviously contracted for the third fight. Fine. Um, looks like the end of the year. And then I said, you know, if they come to you with this undisputed fight, what do you do with Dylan White's situation? And Marisha was insistent, no, the mandatory shot will be after Fury Wilder um, because they know nothing about this undisputed fight because it, it hasn't become official, essentially. What do you think the governing bodies, and especially this Dylan White WB situation, how do you think it's going to resolve itself then? Well, Dylan White's been sitting there as the number one guy in the WBC for, I don't even know. So there's somebody that, that follows me on Twitter that tweets at me all the time, like how many days it's been that he's been the man. It's a long time, I know that. Um, you know, the way that I think Mauricio would look to try to get around this, and I, I say this as somebody that knows Mauricio fairly well, spends time with him when we're uh, at fights, uh, you know, hangs out with him and discusses these boxing issues on a regular basis, that they would look to make a move to maybe give uh, Fury the franchise champion title, which is something that his promoter, uh, his co-promoter Top Rank has embraced. I mean, they went and asked the WBC to give that designation to Lomachenko after they created it for Canelo. So they've given away two franchise titles, one to Canelo, one to Lomachenko. And I think that they would totally embrace that for uh, Tyson Fury. And if they did that, that would automatically make Dillian White go from their interim champion to their WBC champion. Now, Dillian White probably, you know, would be happy to get the title, but I think he probably also would like to fight the fight to, you know, number one, there's a lot of money and exposure in a fight like that. And also the opportunity to become, uh, you know, the man in the weight class, if you win the fight and obviously a huge, you get a lot more money fighting a Tyson Fury uh, for the WBC belt than you do to just get handed the title uh, in terms of them moving him up to the franchise champion. Plus I would submit this, and I've had this argument with Mauricio. When they created the franchise title and they put out their announcement in terms of making Canelo Alvarez their franchise champion, it specifically stated that this was something that they only will give to special fighters, and they meant this whole thing about how it's meant for, you know, a certain level of guys in the sport, but it, you can't win the title. So let's say, uh, you know, Lomachenko goes in the ring against Teofimo Lopez as the WBC's franchise lightweight champion, and Teofimo Lopez should win the fight. He, he doesn't get the WBC franchise title. So the point is, you know, it's, I guess it's cool to have, but it's basically a trophy title. So my perspective, and I said this to Mauricio, who obviously disagreed with me, and again, even though I consider Mauricio a friend of mine, we, you know, sometimes don't agree if the, you know, the grass is green or the sky is blue. Uh, I would say that you, the winner of a Fury versus Joshua fight, if, he's, if Fury goes in as the franchise champion, the winner of the fight will be the lineal champion, will be the number one heavyweight in the world, will have the belts that, uh, that Joshua has, but will not have the WBC title because that would be given to White. So therefore, while that winner is number one, no doubt about it, he's not the undisputed champion. And the reason why is because the undisputed champion means you got all four titles. He wouldn't have the WBC title. So, you know, I personally, you know, I'd like to see all the titles unified, but, you know, look, the sanctioning bodies sometimes actively work against full unification because it's not in their best interest because they would get reduced uh, sanctioning fees sometimes, depending on the level of the fight. So. You know, that's probably the way that they could get, quote unquote, around it. But I don't think that's in the best interest of boxing. I think what should happen, frankly, is Dillian White should just get his chance. That's the bottom line. Yeah, Dan, I, I agree with you there. I mean, when I spoke to Mauricio, and he, he said he has no intentions of making Tyson Fury the WBC franchise champion. However, he Good. could be up tomorrow morning and his mind could change in that. And he can do what he wants because he's a, a sanctioning body. Um, yep. So I, I think you're right. It, essentially, we might not actually get a, a technically undisputed fight um, because they could hand White the belt. And then basically the winner of Fury Joshua, um, whoever comes out superior in that, then has to fight White for the undisputed tag, if you like. And you've also got Alexander Usyk with his WBO mandatory here as well. Well, I'm a little confused about what's going on with that. And I say that because... Uh, my impression has been for a long time, both from the WBO, as well as from Eddie Hearn, as well as from uh, Alexander Usyk's manager, Igis Klimas, is that after the organizations finally settled on who's mandatory went first, meaning either Pulev in the WBO, I'm sorry, Pulev in the IBF, or Usyk in the WBO, it was determined that based on the rotation system of mandatories that the organizations agreed on, 
that Pulev as the IBF mandatory challenger will get the first shot. So that deal is signed and done, and that's the fight that's supposed to happen, you know, whenever they can reschedule it. So that meant that Usyk would be up next. So all along, my, my understanding was that, okay, they could maybe get him to step aside or pay him or do something to alleviate that situation, which I didn't think would be that complicated because he is also uh, co-promoted by Eddie. So I, I thought they would be able to work something out, even though it still hadn't been done yet. They still needed to figure out what was the right dollar figure, what could they do, what was the time frame, et cetera. Now I, had, I saw a thing from Paco of our carcel who was responding to some tweets just yesterday that I was tagged on where somebody was asking, would that mean that the winner of a Fury versus Joshua would then have to fight Usyk for the undisputed title? And he said, yes. When my impression was that Usyk was, would, at least based on the WBO's previous order, would have to get the next shot after the, the win, you know, at the winner of Pula versus Joshua. So I still don't think that that's 100% settled, that, that Usyk's just suddenly you know, either going to walk away uh, get a step aside fee, or they're just suddenly going to give an exception to the winner of uh, of uh, Joshua versus Pulev. So I still think, you know, it's hard enough to make an undisputed fight when there's no impediments. In this situation, you have two champions in Fury and Joshua who both have mandated. Well, Joshua's got two mandatory fights that are that are that are stuck with him. Fury has one uh, plus the rematch. That's why it seems to me that it might be a scenario where they'd have to possibly win two fights apiece to get to each other. You know, Pulev and Usyk for Joshua, the Wilder third fight followed by a Dillian White fight. And it's possible, but that, that's, that's four heavyweight title fights. That's a long time and anything can happen, dude. Anything can happen. So again, I'm glad they worked out the money. Let me know when we have a date, a venue, and there's no other impediments. And then I'll get super excited about it. Well, the scenario you just mentioned, that's a, a possibility. The other one is, of course, Joshua and Pulev do their fight, Fury and Wilder do their fight. Then you get Fury Joshua if they're the winners. But the WBO gets stripped from Joshua and the BC gets stripped from Fury. And essentially, you just have the IBF, WBA and the Ring Magazine lineal status on the line. That could be a scenario. That's possible. And sure, you know what? I, honestly, at that point, you know, if it meant that we're going to get the fight we want to see, mm. I couldn't be mad about it, you know. So we don't get the undisputed, but everybody that watches that fight or sees that fight, you're going to know who the number one heavyweight is. I mean, look, Lennox Lewis ended up having to give up or decided to give up one of his belts after he had become undisputed. That was at a time when it was really considered only the three belts that you needed to be undisputed. Back in that time in the late 90s, there wasn't anybody that considered the WBO to be necessary to be undisputed. That has changed over the last 20 years. But when Lennox Lewis defeated Evander Holyfield and became the undisputed champion, ultimately he gave up one of the belts because instead of fighting a mandatory fight against John Ruiz, which I believe was his WBA mandatory, he said, screw that. I'm the champ. I beat all these guys. I'm going to take the biggest fight that I can make. And at the time, from a financial point of view, and the fight that his broadcaster wanted, which was HBO at the time, they wanted to make the Michael Grant fight. Now, Michael Grant turned out not to be a great heavyweight. But at that moment in time, Michael Grant was clearly, you know, one of the top one or two contenders in the sport. It was a fight that a lot of people wanted to see. And so Lennox Lewis you know, said, forget about John Ruiz. Didn't want to deal with that mess of trying to make a fight with uh, Don King and, and all that and took the bigger fight against uh, Michael Grant. And the point I'm making is that when he fought Michael Grant, nobody in the world who knew a single thing about boxing did not consider Lennox Lewis as the heavyweight champ of the world, regardless of the fact that he was shy one belt for the status of undisputed. So in the case of what you just laid out, if for some reason one belt was stripped or given up or this or that, and we still saw Anthony Joshua in the ring against Tyson Fury without them having, you know, lost any interim fights. People are going to know that the winner of that fight, whatever belts they have, they're the champ. End of story. I mean, listen, in my mind, Tyson Fury is the champ. All due respect to Joshua because Fury beat the man who beat the man who beat the man. And the man was Klitschko. Whatever you want to say about how he got to that point, he was the guy for a decade. He was the best heavyweight. He was the number one heavyweight. He had most of the belts. You know, his brother had the other one. And Tyson Fury beat him. And, and, and so forth. So he's the number one heavyweight, but Joshua clearly is number two at worst. So put the one and two together and we'll see, we'll see who comes out on top. I mean, it's a, it's a dream matchup. In this conversation so far, we've mentioned a lot of heavyweights, but only one's been Amer from America. So you've had Tyson Fury, Joshua, White, all from Britain, Alexander Ruzik uh, and Kubrat Pulev from, from Europe. 
And of course, Wilder is this kind of standalone guy in America. If he gets wiped out by Fury in this third fight, you know, we know the lightweight division, the welterweight division is very healthy in America. Uh, it's stacked with Americans right at the top of the division. Um, but in the heavyweight scene, where's this next guy coming from? You've got Michael Hunter in there. But yeah, where are the hopes for America in the heavyweight scene, uh, Dan? Well, first of all, some of the fighters that you mentioned, while they may not be American, they fight in America. I mean, I know that Tyson Fury and Joshua, you know, the hope is it would be in Britain, but Tyson Fury made it very clear that he was basing himself in America for his fight. So his last three fights, or no, his last four fights have been here. Uh, the first Wilder fight, the second Wilder fight, and then the two uh, fights in between against Whalen and Tom Schwartz. So yeah, he's not American, but he's been fighting in America. You know, Usyk has fought many of his uh, fights in America also. Uh, you know, his manager is, you know, based in America. So, you know, they're not American, fair enough. But like you said, as far as who's an actual American in the heavyweight division, I mean, look, you know, Adam Kornacki was a hope he got beat by Hellenius uh, back in March. Um, you know, maybe he can make a comeback and, and rise through the ranks again and get himself in position, maybe get, you know, uh, in a little better condition and, and work on some of his defensive abilities. But, you know, he's a very uh, quality offensive fighter. So there's still hope for him. You mentioned Michael Hunter, uh, you know, who has, uh, you know, been a pretty good contender for the last few years once he moved up from the cruiserweight division. You know, where his only loss was in that division was to Usyk, where? In America. Matter of fact, that fight took place 20 minutes from my house, you know, at a, at a casino in, uh, in Maryland, which is very close by. Um, there was, there's, there's one American heavyweight, and again, I'm, I don't want to jump the gun and get two. I mean, he's still a ways away, but and, and the reason he's in my mind is because he fought on the top rank card uh, that took place on Tuesday. Jared Anderson. American boxing, exactly. Jared Anderson, who's, uh, I forget, he's either 20 or 21 years old. He's a young guy was uh, one of the top American amateurs. I think most people would have thought that uh, had he not turned pro, he would have wound up as uh, the United States rep in the Olympic Games, uh, which ended up being postponed anyway. So, but he signed with top rank. He's managed by James Prince and uh, he's got a good team behind him. And, you know, he's looked good at, at that age, but to me, it's not even that he looked good in three professional fights. He's not fighting anybody, obviously, at this point. Um, but Tyson Fury speaks highly of, uh, highly very, of him. Very highly. Tyson's sparring partners, uh, they brought him into the camp when Tyson Fury was getting ready to fight Deontay in the second fight. So, you know, again, he's a few, he's, he's probably a few years away from making noise. But if there's a hope, uh, you know, I guess he'd be one of them just off the top of my head as far as a younger American, uh, you know, prospect, you know, in that division. Uh, somebody definitely to keep an eye on from Toledo, Ohio, you know, middle America. And, uh, you know, looks like he's got great power and tremendous uh, size, a good disposition. And, uh, you know, I'm interested to watch him develop. Dan, any weight classes, uh, give me five fights, five mega fights you'd like to see. Uh, and we'll, we'll take Fury Joshua out of this. So five uh, from any weight classes. All right. Well, in no particular order, let's see, off the top of my head, five big fights. Well, okay. I mean, this fight's going to happen. It's just a matter of when and they can get it done. As I can't wait to see uh, Lomachenko against Tiafimo Lopez. That's a tremendous matchup for many, many reasons. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm a super, super big fan of the lightweight division's younger fighters. So even if you take Lomachenko out of the equation, because he's in his 30s and and uh, and not on the young side after all the amateur experience that he's had. But the I want to see, and I, again, they're not mega fights yet, but I think they can be built up to that, that realm uh, in the future. Um, and that's to put the four really superb young guys in some kind of round robin with each other that can carry boxing for several years. I actually, I did a commentary on my Impact show about that exact uh, uh, situation that I'm looking forward to if they can get it worked out promotionally and TV-wise. We're talking about fights involving, you know, all against each other. Tiafimo Lopez, Devin Haney, Gervonta Davis, all of whom have versions of titles at 135 pounds, and Ryan Garcia, who's looking for a shot at one of the titles. Those guys are all charismatic. They're all unbeaten. They're all exciting to watch. Uh, they're, they're all in their younger 20s. You know, Gervonta uh, Davis is 25 years old. The other three guys are like 21, 22. I mean, they're going to be around for a while. So, again, I don't know if that qualifies in your question as a one singular mega fight, but give me those guys – in some kind of matchups with each other over the next few years, I'd be super pumped about that. Uh, an authentic mega fight would be a fight that everybody talks about, and hopefully they can somehow find a way to make it happen. And that's Errol Spence Jr. against Terrence Crawford for the uh, welterweight unification. The two fighters have spoken about fighting each other. They say it every time you ask about it that they want it. And, you know, the promoters seem open to doing it, but there has to be some political will to actually sit down at the table and get it done. Uh, I don't think anything's going to happen 
as it relates to that bout until Errol Spence comes back uh, and fights for the first time since he was in his auto accident in last October. Now, he says he doesn't want a tune-up fight. There's a lot of conversation that most likely they're just going to reschedule the fight against Danny Garcia that was supposed to be in January. And so, you know, he was injured and then the pandemic, so there was no fight. So when he comes back, probably sometime in the later part of the year, uh, if he's if the Garcia fight is put back together and he beats it, and Crawford has probably some other fight, I'm not sure who or where or when, um, hopefully next year, you know, it, it could be the big fight that we see outside heavyweight. So if you're talking about a 2021 where we're going to perhaps have two helpings of Anthony Joshua against Tyson Fury and also the potential of a, a Wilder, or rather a, a Crawford versus Spence, I mean, just those three f- fights alone make for a massive year. Um, but but those are those are huge fights that you know that I mentioned. I mean, and you can go through different divisions. I mean, then there's lots of interesting matchups that you could put together. I'm not sure any of them rises to the level of the the welterweight fight or or the the heavyweight fights we spoke about. And by the way, don't discount you know Manny Pacquiao being in another big fight against one of these other top contenders. Uh, I don't know if it's at the same level as some of the fights I just mentioned, but there's been a lot of conversation about the prospect of him against Mikey Garcia at some point, which I don't think is super competitive. But I'm down for that fight. I like seeing that fight. That's interesting to me. Well, Pacquiao Crawford as well, apparently heading to the Middle East. You know, I believe it when I see it, to be honest with you. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it, it, it won't happen, but, you know, we've heard a lot of rumblings about a lot of different fights, and then suddenly they just go away. Um, but, again, if they make that fight, I mean, they, Top Rank wanted to do that fight a couple years ago in, like, 2017 when Manny Pacquiao was still part of the Top Rank promotional company, and it, it didn't happen. Um, so I know that Terrence Crawford would be interested to do that fight. He's always said he's willing and ready and able to fight against uh, Manny Pacquiao. And, uh, you know, that's the kind of name, frankly, that Terrence Crawford needs on his record to, I mean, those of us that follow him closely, we know that Terrence Crawford is a tremendous talent and a, and a great fighter with all kinds of Hall of Fame potential and already a pretty good resume and a lot of accomplishment. But the general public doesn't really know him yet. And, but if he can score a win over a big name like Manny Pacquiao, obviously that can help. Um, sort of the same way that, that we all knew how great like Floyd Mayweather and Manny Pacquiao were before, but they had a, for the general public to really know, they had to get those wins against Oscar De La Hoya, who was the icon. And, you know, he helped bring them from, you know, modest pay-per-view success to mega fights on pay-per-view. And Terrence Crawford needs that kind of opponent to put himself, you know, in that, in that level of name. I know Shakur just fought uh, uh, Super Feather, but I, I'd like to see him and Josh Warrant in that February. I think that's a brilliant fight. Well, it's a fight that Shakur Stevenson has been talking about for a while. He's one of the fight. You know, he, he – look, how many young guys at age 22 who just won a world title are willing in their very first defense – the most guys would take a soft fight, go home, make a payday against a soft touch, a hand-picked guy. Sure, Shakur is a different kind of animal when it comes to that. He's like, look, first defense – I'm only going to be at featherweight for a little bit longer. I want to make the most of it. So give me the money, and I'll go and uh, I'll go on the plane, and I'll fly to the U.K., and I'll take Josh Warrington on in his backyard. He was willing to do that. Uh, and if you talk to Shakur, you know, he'll tell you, look, the money that they offered was not enough to make me do that. I'm willing to do that. But I made – well, his fight got canceled against Mariaga because of the coronavirus. But had he had gone through with that fight, he claims that the amount of money he would have made to fight in New York City, right outside his hometown of Newark, to fight against Mariaga, a guy that he'd be, you know, a pretty big favorite against compared to Warrington. He was being paid more than, than Eddie Hearn was offering him to have the fight, uh, you know, in the UK against Warrington. So I understood why that didn't happen. So he, I think he's still game for it, but you're going to have to show him the money. I mean, and I don't think it's going to take that much more money. Just got to gotta make it right. And I think there's no reason why that fight can't happen. But I'll be skeptical because now you got Warrington talking about fighting uh, Zhu Tan, you know, who's the – uh, one of the regular title holder in the WBA, Shakur just fought at 130. Uh, not sure if he's going to stay in that weight class or if there's something interesting for him to come back down to featherweight. But there's no doubt in my mind that Shakur Stevenson is ready, willing, and able to do a Josh Warrington fight overseas as long as he's not disrespected in terms of his purse. A couple of more things then uh, before we close off. Uh, you know, uh, during the middle of this kind of pandemic, there was so much talk about Mike Tyson, Evan Holyfield. James Tony. Um, this talk has, has slowed down a little. Bit. Oh, hold on. There was talk about James Tony. James Tony as well. James Tony shouldn't even be training in the gym, much less thinking about a real fight. There was a, a different day. 
this uh, this talk slowed down uh, a lot recently. Do you know anything about the potential returns of uh, these former legends? I mean, nothing concrete other than what they've been saying, you know, throughout a number of media uh, uh, interviews and such. Uh, you know, I know I have my opinion. Uh, you know, it's funny, just yesterday was the anniversary, the 15th anniversary of Mike Tyson's, what we think was his final fight against Kevin McBride, which I covered, which took place in Washington, D.C., about 25 minutes from my house uh, at what was then the MCI Center in Washington. And people who think that Mike Tyson, and I, I love Tyson, I grew up watching Tyson. Uh, I got to know Mike, I've interviewed him a million times, I covered many of his fights. But if you wanna understand why some people, I understand why some people are excited about the prospect of a comeback, because he's such a legend, such a big name, such an icon. And yes, he did look good for 15 or 20 seconds on a video uh, that he put up on, on social media, I get it. But if you wanna understand why it's a bad idea, think about the fact that 15 years ago, he could barely fight against Kevin McBride, got knocked out, quit, fight before that. Again, big under, big, big favorite against the underdog, your, your countryman, Danny Williams, got knocked out in Louisville. I was there. Uh, if, if you have any thoughts that Mike can still make it go against a real serious heavyweight at age 53, 15 years removed from his fighting days, go on YouTube and watch the McBride fight and watch the Williams fight, and you'll understand why people like myself, who have no ill will towards Mike Tyson whatsoever, say this is a horrendous idea. And by the way, the same goes for Evander Holyfield. Now, he may not have gotten beat up the way that Mike Tyson did in those last few fights of his career. But Evander Holyfield at one point was suspended by the state of New York because his skills were so eroded that they didn't believe that he could protect himself in these fights. So, you know, he didn't get knocked out the way Tyson did, but he also did not look good in, in many of his late fights. And I covered a lot of Evander Holyfield's fights. And I tell you, I was with Evander in February out in Vegas. I spent time with him at the uh, Tyson Fury Deontay Wilder rematch. He's in good shape. And, you know, he's, you bump into him and he feels like a rock. But, uh, again, there's a difference between being in good shape at age 57, I believe Evander is now, than, than being in good shape to actually get into a boxing and fight another guy, you know, in a, in a serious boxing match. So even if they talk about exhibitions, you know, it sort of makes me cringe because I don't want to see these guys just, you know, just get abused for no reason. I, you can't take away their competitive spirit, their fighters, from the crib, basically. And that's how they're going to be till they die. But, you know why the public would want to pay money to watch them at this age go into a boxing ring. I don't know. You know, you can watch all their fights for free on various platforms. So I don't take it. Matter of fact, just tonight on Showtime in America, they're going to show a series of Tyson's fights. They've been showing, uh, you know, uh, classic fights uh, on the weekends for the past several weeks. So they've got a, um, like a couple hour block where they're showing like Tyson, Brian Nielsen and Tyson Galata and, and Tyson, uh, uh, the rematch against, um, I think Bruce, uh, is it Bruce Seldon? Not Bruce Seldon. They're uh, Frank Bruno, maybe. They're showing, I don't know if the Bruno fight's part of it, but they're showing several of those later fights. I know Franz off both a fight. Point is, you want to see Tyson knock guys out? Watch those old fights that Showtime's going to show over a nice long block on Friday night. Not as a 53-year-old, you know, in the ring against uh, an actual opponent. Just the, uh, two more topics. Uh, Floyd Mayweather and also Anthony Joshua um, made a controversial speech. I don't know if you saw that. Let's start with Floyd Mayweather. Um, coming back uh, as a trainer, it looks like, Dan. And are you surprised he's uh, training Devin Haney when uh, Devin's lightweight rival is, of course, Tank and, and he's under Mayweather promotions? What's your thoughts on that situation, Dan? Well, the first thing is, in terms of Floyd being a trainer, if it's something he wants to do, in other words, make the commitment, because Floyd's the kind of person at this stage of his life and the amount of money he's made and his fame, where he just likes to do what he wants to do and not necessarily stay to a schedule. If you're going to take on a young fighter, you know, that, you need to be there for that fighter, whether that means an eight-week training camp and being there and, and, and being on call, essentially, uh, and, and, and being available and taking, more importantly, taking a back seat to the fighter. You know, Floyd loves the spotlight. And you're a trainer, you know, typically it's the, tra it's the trainer that takes the back seat and it's the fighter that's in the spotlight. If Floyd can make the time commitment and he's willing to accept a role a little bit in the background, I think Floyd can be probably one of the great trainers in boxing because he knows so much. He, I mean, he had gloves on when he was like four years old. He comes from a great boxing family. His father was a, was a, a good professional, fought Sugar Ray Leonard in a distance fight. His uncle Jeff was a good professional. His uncle Roger, who recently passed, was a world champion uh, and one of, the, one of the top fighters of the 1980s. So, so he's got the knowledge. He certainly has the experience. 
It's just, does he have the desire to put in the time and effort it takes? If he does, he can be a great trainer. Uh, I wouldn't blame him if he doesn't because it's not like he's going to make huge money there compared to what he's already made. But if he just wants to do it because he wants to help a kid achieve his dreams, then I think that Floyd could do that. As far as Devin Haney specifically is concerned, Floyd Mayweather and Devin Haney have known each other since Devin Haney was a little kid growing up in Vegas and seeing Mayweather in the gym. So he's known Devin as a, as a small child all the way up now that Devin is a, is a you know, 21 year old grown man far longer than he's known Gervonta Davis, who he's a promoter of. Secondly, I don't think that he's like his official trainer. Yes, they work together in the gym on some stuff. And for Devin, that's a great experience because who can't pass up the opportunity to go in the ring and learn from a great like Mayweather. Um, to my knowledge, Bill Haney, his father, is still the trainer. But Devin would be silly not to take some, some uh, direction or, or lessons if Floyd wants to be there to give it to him. But I don't, I don't know how serious that is in terms of him like in full-time commitment. Um, and by the way, just because he's the promoter of Javante Davis, it doesn't mean anything to me until they actually make a fight between Devin Haney and Javante Davis. Then it would be interesting. Then I would be, uh, you know, I'd be like, hmm, that's kind of interesting. At the moment, though, with no real movement towards making that match, I see no reason why it's a big deal for Floyd, who lives in Vegas, and, and Devin, that lives in Vegas, who trains with his dad, to maybe go get a few tips and, and work on the mitts and some strategies with Floyd Mayweather. Who would, you know, who wouldn't uh, take that opportunity? All right, just to round off, um, of course, we saw horrific scenes uh, with the, the terrible murder of George Floyd. And, and since then, you know, at, uh, where you're living, uh, outside your house and, and around your area, I'm sure there's a load of protests, same here in London and really across the world, uh, Dan. And Anthony Joshua um, attended a, a peaceful protest uh, just outside of London in a, in a place called Watford, where he's from. Uh, mm -hmm. and read a speech and uh, there was a certain line uh, that caught the boxing world's attention first and then it went to, to national news, um, certainly in the UK. Um, have you seen the speech and do you know what I'm referring to, Dan? I saw a good chunk of it. Re refresh my memory and what was the controversial line that he said. Now, my understanding was I saw that and I, and I totally get that he was um, making the point that, you know, the, as people are protesting here, the Black Lives Matter, which I certainly agree with. Um, but some people got upset with one of the things that he said, which apparently, from my understanding, was not something that Anthony, a speech that he wrote, he was reading something else that somebody else had written. But what was it that got everybody so ticked off? That's correct. So I'll, I'll summarize this in a nutshell. So you, you're right in saying it was someone else's speech. But of course, if he's reading it out in public, he's responsible for them words as well. Oh, is this is true. Be correct. Um, what he said was abstain from spending money in their businesses. Now, his speech was about racism. And I had watched it and I didn't think there was a problem because I thought he was saying, do not invest in racist uh, industries, businesses, etc." That's right. what I took from it. That's what everyone... I would take that the same way. You took that the same way? So some people probably took that to mean As that he was saying, businesses. don't spend money in a person's business if it's owned by a white owner. There you go. But I mean, if you clip out a little bit without the context, it looks like right. that. I understand that. I cannot profess to like be Anthony Joshua's best friend or know him extremely well. But I, I know, Ant, you know, as a journalist who's covered his career from the beginning to some degree, uh, you know, have interviewed him many times, both in person and on the phone, been at some of his fights and covered them. Again, I, again, I'm not, not going to bullshit you and say we're best buddies and I know him that well. But I, I feel like I have a pretty decent read on the kind of person he is, even from just some of the interactions we've had that weren't like official interviews that were private moments between the two of us. Even if he said that as somebody else's thing, I don't think he literally meant that in a negative way. Don't spend money if a business is owned by a white person. I would take it more like you mentioned, which is if you know this business to be owned by somebody that's a racist or that has shown racist tendencies, you know, you do well not to spend your money with that person. So I think it's much to do about nothing. I think Anthony Joshua is a genuinely good person, uh, you know, who has the best interest at heart and wanted to use his, his, um, his platform as a, a superstar athlete and as a heavyweight world champion to say something positive about the situation. So I think it was a much to do about nothing in my mind. And, uh, you know, I think Anthony Joshua, like, like these people that are out protesting, uh, you know, for things to be better, uh, you know, in terms of race relations, you know, and hard to ignore that and hard to say negative about that. So I don't, I don't, I don't have a problem with what Anthony Joshua said or did. 
All right, Dan, we've got uh, a lot through there. You always make time for IFL, uh, whether it's in person or on Zoom. So I appreciate it, Dan. Uh, My pleasure. Thank you. Um, yeah, look after yourself for the rest of lockdown. Hopefully, uh, we see, I know Top Rank have brought boxing back, but we uh, kind of get into the swing of things now, uh, sooner rather than later. But yeah, take care. Well, Dan. Having the fights back is good, but it's, it's unfortunate there's, there's no media or fans ringside. So hopefully, we've got the fights back, but sometime before the end of the year, not only will the fans be back in the arenas seeing good fights, but, uh, you know, yourself, myself, and all the other media guys will be back uh, at ringside together again. Yeah, as really long cool. as the flight's open from America and to the UK, yeah. that's what we need. That too, that's true. All right, cheers, Dan. I'll catch you soon, all right? All right, Omar, you have a good day. Take care, man. Thank you.